we're going to record this session. The session is recorded for later retrieval. Uh, my name is Andreas. I'm the uh, director of operations at Streetsboro City Schools. Uh, that is in Northeast Ohio, uh, north of Akron, south of Cleveland is how I usually describe it. We're going to work on uh, Google Forms, some of the basics, some of the intermediate stuff, and then maybe an advanced feature or two. Um, would love for you to um, noodle along at home. Uh, if you want, you can open up your own Google form and take a look at some of the things uh, that I'll be showing you. Um, but if you don't, that's okay. Uh, you can watch the recording later. If you have questions, you can go back, step back in time. If you do have questions, uh, feel free to send them over to me in the chat feature. Just click on the chat down below and then put your questions there and uh, I will do my best to uh, get to them here as the, as the, as the day progresses. We'll go from 9.50 here. We've started until 10.40, and then I think there's another session starting at 9.50 um, for the day. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to share my screen, desktop one. And then quick thing here, I think everything should be, should be set up and ready to go. You should see my untitled form. Um, and so we're going to start. Um, Google Forms have... Uh, has seen some changes over the last couple of years. It started out as a pretty decent uh, suite to collect some data, and then it has sort of evolved from there. And what we're seeing today uh, should be the same version that you're on. Sometimes I, f I find that school districts are not on what's called a rapid release domain for their Google setup. And so they don't always see the latest features right away, but now I think we've typically caught up in terms of Google Forms. So we should be sort of on the same version. Uh, always, always start out by naming your form. I, I see a lot of people that will create a whole form and they'll even send it out and then it'll be untitled. And uh, when someone sends that to you to collect data and it says, oh, fill out this untitled form, uh, I just get angry and I, I don't wanna participate. So start by filling it out and I'll show you a quick uh, and easy method here. So we'll say PD day form demo. Um, um, and then if you move your mouse up here into the top left where it's untitled form, what will happen then is it'll grab that title from the form. Boom. Just like that. You just click and it'll grab it. Now, you can have two different names. That's okay. And if you change this, this won't change. So just a quick and easy. If you want to sort the form, you can move it into a folder right here. If you want to star it, you can do it right here. So if it's a form that you're going to keep do, you know, using for a long time, uh, you might want to star it so that you can get to it quickly to make adjustments and whatnot, and you can unstar it. Uh, we're going to just kind of work through the test questions first, or the form questions first, just so you have an idea of what they can, uh, and more importantly, what they shouldn't be used for, because uh, you don't want to use the wrong question type to collect data. Notice that the form itself has a description. So, you know, this is where you put instructions. Say it's a t-shirt order form, say it's a lunch form, you know, whatever it might be. You might want to put some instructions there. If it's um, if you're collecting information from your students, have some information there. It gives you an untitled question. So here's a question, just says untitled, option one. And then our menu bar, sort of our options bar, is over here to the right. And that's where we're going to go through then kind of an add a question. We're going to import some questions. We're going to look at some titling, uh, maybe some images, videos, and a new section in the form. We're going to talk about best practices here in a little bit as well. We'll start with the first question. So in this case, I want to collect your last name. Uh, and notice what happens. The form itself figures out, oh, last name. So it changes it over to the short answer type question. Notice if you do a drop down click here, you'll see we have short answer, paragraph, and so on. And, and we're going to go through all of them so you have an idea of what they do. Um, but if you're collecting things like Last name, first name, you know, the short answer question type is the appropriate one to use. Um, this is what it'll look like. You can make any question required. Just know that if uh, for a short, you know, short answer one, like you can put anything there and it'll be kind of, it'll meet the requirement of, of having something typed in. So just keep that in mind. But if you make it required, they have to put something in there, whoever's taking your survey or filling out the form. So just something to think about. All right, we're going to add a new question and we're going to click the plus up here. And the next one we're going to choose is the paragraph. 
If you're just joining us, uh, go ahead and mute yourself, please, in the meeting. And just a quick heads up again that it is being uh, recorded, so uh, that you have that. Um, so for the paragraph type, the paragraph type allows you to collect more text. Now you could take entire sort of essay questions here, probably not advisable, but paragraph, short answer type stuff is, is pretty good. Um, so um, your life story will go here. The difference between the short answer and the long answer is that in the spreadsheet, the sort of the, the space that it allocates is different. And so you'll want to uh, keep that in mind when you collect your survey. Next question. Uh, oh, something we should note too that um, there are some ways of sort of checking uh, this data, kind of validating it. It's not a good idea to use that as a as a test setup to sort of say, okay, well, they typed in Stockholm as a capital of Sweden with a lower S and the right answer is the capital S. That's just going to, it's too much work. So I wouldn't even think about that. Uh, next text question, we're going to put in a multiple choice. That's the first one of sort of the, you know, typical survey type questions. Notice that a multiple choice um, uses what's called a radio button. That's that round button. Uh, that allows you to only choose one. And so I think of this as the multiple alternatives because you're only making one choice. It's not actually multiple choices. You're making one. So we're going to say, what is the capital of Sweden. And then we're going to fill in our options, right? We're going to say Stockholm, Copenhagen, Oslo, Helsinki, right? You get a little geography lesson today. And I'm not going to add Reykjavik because that one's hard to spell. So I'll probably get it wrong. Um, notice that when the person takes a survey or whatever they do with this, they can only pick one. That's almost always true for a radio button. So if you see a radio button on the internet, it'll only allow you to select one because that's how that function is set up. They cannot set up or choose more than one. Now I want to show you sort of an advanced feature here um, of the multiple choice question. And that is as you're hovering over the answer choice or the, the, the alternative here, you'll notice that an image pops up, like an image symbol pops up for each one. So if you're doing an assessment or if you're asking for uh, data from sort of a younger clientele, or if you're just using it to kind of, you know, identify X, you can use an image instead of the actual text. And so for this one, you can click on the image and you can upload, you can use your camera, you can get a URL, photos, Google Drive or Google image search. And so you could even sort of search for Stockholm and let's pick an iconic picture here. Let's see, uh, there it is. That's where they have the Nobel prize. And then same thing, you could do the same thing for Copenhagen, right? Copenhagen, if I could spell it right. Iconic image from Copenhagen with the colorful houses and so on and so forth. And so instead of just having texts there uh, or text answers or text options, you could cater to your students. You could make it uh, work for them by including images. And so for example, if you're doing, I don't even know, parts of a cell or uh, phonemes or colors, or you know, if you're doing a foreign language test, uh, you know, pick the word for cat or whatever you wanna do, uh, you could use the image function. Now, the images won't be part of the answer, so you'll have to think about that when you um, when you're kind of thinking about what the data is going to look like, right? Um, you're going to have to think about, you know, you're going to actually get the text as the, the image, and we're just going to finish it out here with Helsinki. Why not? Uh, I I like to use the Google image search because it's pretty easy. Uh, it's pretty easy to kind of uh, use it and it's quick and dirty, if you will. So there we go, loading image. So now we have a multiple choice, which only allows you to select one and we've added some pictures to that. We're gonna do a new one. Notice that this toolbar over here keeps floating down with you, kind of helpful. So I'm gonna click a new one. And instead of multiple choice, we're gonna do a checkbox. The checkbox question is um, select your pets, right, for example. The checkboxes allows you to pick all that apply. 
So keep that in mind. The radio button, only one. Check boxes, all that apply. So if you put in cat, dog, lizard, snake, fish, none, whoops, they can pick all of them. And so in terms of a data collection method, you have to think about what are you gonna do with the data? And this is very, very important. When you're designing any kind of a form, even if it's a quiz or if it's a survey or if it's an order form or whatever, you really wanna to think to yourself, okay, what am I gonna do with the data? Only collect the data that you're actually going to use and make it as simple and short as possible for those that are interacting with your survey or a quiz or whatever it is that you're doing. If you make it long, arduous, difficult, uh, you'll get bad data and that'll be bad for you in the end. So try to uh, really think about that as opposed to collecting everything under the ocean, you know, or everything under the, the sky. Um, what are you gonna do with it? So for example, if you start out school with welcome back to school, instead of that three by five index card or, you know, write a post-it note with information about yourself, you know, tell me about yourself. Are you going to use it? Because Google Forms lets you collect everything. But if you're not going to use it, um, don't collect it. That's my advice there. In this case, someone will be able to select all cat, dog, lizard, snake, all of it. Now, if you're doing a list like this and um, you're not sure, you can always add an option to add another, add other, and it'll add an open one. And then they get to type that in themselves. Be careful because that is not validated data. So now they're not picking from your list that you put together. They're adding their own choice. So use that with caution, but it could be like, what kind of pizza would you like to have or whatever? And if, you know, vegetarian with gluten-free crust isn't on there, you can type that in as a respondent. And then if we get more people that like that, then maybe we can acquiesce, but you want to be kind of careful there. And we'll see here what it's going to look like in a little bit. Okay. Add question. We're going to go and we're going to select uh, drop down. Drop down does the same thing as a multiple choice. And so it only allows you to select uh, one in Google Forms. But the drop down uh, is beneficial because instead of making the form long, you know, like all the different things, it shrinks it down to one. And you've seen this all the time. Like when you're logging on and creating a um, user account, you have to put in your um, date of birth and that you know scrolling on a mobile device right this is great for that you know so we could say what year were you born right and then uh, you could I'm just gonna throw in a uh, I'm gonna open up a Google sheet here because I'm gonna show the power of Google Forms so I'm gonna make a list so I'm gonna say um, 1980 1981 1982. Okay, watch what happens. I'm just using Google Sheets as like a tool. Google Sheets knows what it is that I want. Oops, now we have a long list. But here's what I want to do. So I'm interested in, in these. I'm going to copy that. So I made myself a list. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to come back to my form and I'm just going to go control V. Loop. I got my long list of years. Right, and this would take up this would take up a whole a whole screen if you're doing a Google Sheet or a Google Form, you know, with a multiple choice, you know, select the year you were born. Drop down is going to condense it, and we're going to be able to select from one. You see it all the time when people select, like, what state are you in, you know, what city are you in, if you want to have a pre-selected things like that, um, because we have 50 states. Uh, I did a registration form last year, I think, that included sort of all of North America, so we had all the states, all the territories, all the Mexican states all the Canadian territories. That was a long list. It was like 80 something. So we used a drop down, select where you're from. And you'll see the benefit here in a little bit. Notice too though, that I did a little life hack with Google Sheets, copied and pasted into Google Forms because there's no reason to type all that stuff. So you could have a Google Sheet with a lot of lists in it that you didn't copy and paste. All right, next question. Uh, multiple choice, checkboxes, drop down, file upload. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, what I love is uh, this works really well um, when you're collecting files and you want them to be of a certain kind. So you don't want to like take files from whomever, but you want them to be um, upload your file, oops, file here. And I would say allow only specific file types. What kind? 
only PDF or whatever it is that you want. You can have students upload things. They can upload an image of their math homework, for example, or a form, or they can upload a video, whatever, document, spreadsheet, PDF, you can decide. Maximum number of files, one, five, or 10. I'm gonna say I only want you to upload one. Maximum file size, 100 megabytes, that's it. That's all I want you to be able to upload, or maybe 10, right? Depends on what you want. So you can kind of choose that very handy. Next one, linear scale. Now we're coming into rating. So this is more survey territory. The, the other stuff was like sort of give me some information. This is more uh, do a rating on a linear scale. And so this would be like, how are you liking professional development so far? You know, how was the PD day 2020? I think anything with 2020 is going to get a low score from here on out, but we'll use it anyways. Uh, notice that you can set your scale yourself from zero or one to really two to 10. Um, this is what's known as a Likert score uh, or Likert scale. My advice to you is to use an even numbered scale. So in this case, I would do a one to four, one to six, one to eight. But if I do a one to five, right? What's in the, in the middle? There's one, two, then there's three, and then there's four and five. And the three value is that neutral value that people will tell you if they're not really interested. So if you do a one to four, it's a lot easier because the one to four will um, force them to kind of choose one and two is gonna be lower scores, three and four is gonna be higher scores. And then you can label it. You can say uh, it was terrible, amazing, right? Try to build a scale labeling um, that pertains to the question. So instead of just having the same bad, good, make it connect to the rating that you're wanting them to rate because you'll get better choices. The person taking the, the question will be more in tune and they'll be more interested in giving you the right value or the right data. So think about that. So that's your rating scale. A one to 10 is almost useless. So if you're using a one to 10 scale, what's the difference between a seven and an eight? How did you like the pasta sauce? Seven, eight, I have no idea. But a one to four, it was either like good or really good or bad or like terrible, right? So that's my, my preference. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to use an even numbered scale. I'm never going to have the neutral. I'm never going to have the undecided in between. I'm going to force people to decide. Next one. I'm going to go to multiple choice grid. I like this one. This one's pretty easy to use. Um, it's uh, again, can take advantage of what's called the Likert scale. Right. And, and so I'll construct it here in a way that you'll see where you can use the Likert scale. And that's the, the disagree agree one. And again, I would, only have four values, I would not have the five. So here's here's what I would how I do it. I would say rate the following statements. And then rows and columns. Rows are going to be your statements, columns are going to be your scores. And so I'm going to start over here. I'm going to say um, you know, strongly, oops, disagree, disagree, oops, agree. Strongly agree. Okay, there's our Likert scale from bad to, to good. Now, I found anecdotally when I was teaching, I uh, flipped them. So I started with the strongly agree and I tended to get skewed, uh, sort of skewed averages there where people, this, I think you stop, you go, you, we read from left to right in the Western world. Um, and so I think you stop at the first acceptable answer. And so if strongly agree was acceptable or agree, you tend, they tended not to sort of go all the way to the right if it was in this order, but that doesn't okay. Okay, uh, I, let's see, here's, here's, here's row one. So we're gonna say, I am a good student. I enjoy school. I have friends. School, math is easy. Okay, you get the idea of some, some of these statements. We're gonna look at what it looks like here in a little bit. Uh, so just think about that. The next one, and I'm not gonna go there and, and, and I'm gonna tell you why. So the next one is the, the checkbox grid. 
you can decide if you want to use that one. I don't really understand how to use it. And I got to be totally honest with you. Uh, I'm sure there's ways of using it. I think the output into the spreadsheet is a little bit clumsy. And so I haven't really found a good way to use the multiple or the checkbox grid. So we're going to leave it out. I'm just going to skip it, deal with it. Uh, I think it becomes really confusing in terms of how to use it and how to set it up and then what the data that you get looks like. So I'm going to advise against it. So the next one I'm going to collect is the date, date of uh, incident, for example. Um, some of you probably do PBIS, um, behavioral referral, things like that. You might want to ask, and in addition to the timestamp that the Google form gives you, what, uh, what data are we talking about? Because if you allow someone to uh, enter data for yesterday or for last week or whatever, um, then you might want to say, okay, well, what was the date of the incident? So the date uh, selector allows you to do that. Same thing with the time selector. That's the one at the bottom. What time did it occur? And again, the, you'll get a date and timestamp for each submission of the form. But if you're collecting data about something that has happened outside of that, you can't submit a form right as the behavior happens. And so it might be helpful. I oversee uh, school bus transportation as part of one of my responsibilities here. And so we collect um, red light violation data. So every time a school bus gets passed by a motorist, when our school bus has their red lights on because we're either picking up or dropping off students, we log it and then we map it on a Google map and then we share that with the police department. And so in that case, I wanna know what date did it happen, what time did it happen, and I wanna have that in the correct spreadsheet format. Okay, so we've added some test questions or survey questions or whatever you want, call them. Now we're gonna look at what does it look like. Go up, scroll all the way up to the top. You'll see a puzzle piece, you'll see the customize items, you'll see the preview eye. We're gonna click there. That'll open up a new tab. Uh, and it'll show us what the form will look like. So here's our last name. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Hopefully that works. Um, notice here that it says the name of photo associated with your Google account will be recorded when you upload files and submit this form, right? And I'll show you where that setting is. It's great for working inside of your Google domain, but you can turn that off so that you could work with parents too and collect data from, from just anyone. But working with kids, teachers, staff inside of a domain is like ideal because it'll automatically collect who they are. Last name, right? So I'll just fill it out here. Johansson, life story, who knows? That's just sort of text data, right? What is the capital of Sweden? Look at this. You could choose not to have text here. You could just have answer A, answer B, answer C, uh, and then you would know you know, you would have to know what it is. I'm going to choose Stockholm. It'll select it. I can even click on the picture itself. And notice here that when I select something else, that answer choice, it only allows me to select one answer choice, right? So just keep that in mind. That's that multiple choice, but it's really singular choice, multiple alternatives. Select your pets. Check boxes so I can check all that I want. And that's dangerous depending on what what you're collecting, because watch this, cat, dog, lizard, none. What? This would be better served maybe with multiple choice, but what if you have multiple kinds of pets, right? So that's why you have to think about that. Or if you do other, right, uh, you can um, put in a pet of choice there. So we'll take that. Cat and a dragon. What year were you born? Now, notice from Google Sheets, right? Long list there. 20 years, we put 20 years. See how little space it takes up? And when you click on it, you just get a sweet drop down, and then you can maneuver. On a mobile, you just use that little scrolling wheel. On a Chromebook, desktop, whatever, you have full control. So you can make that pretty accurate year. You can go all the way back to 1900, up to you know 2050, and you're set for life, depending on how long you're gonna be sticking around using Google Forms. So, I'll select a date. That is not my birth year, so no worries there. Upload your file, select the file. Um, you can select it from your device. Remember, we were only allowed to upload documents and PDFs, so we'll see if I have some of those things here. I'll just select a, a random research article from this weekend, add it, upload it. It's painless. We use it for a workflow here at Streetsboro where parents or whoever wants to distribute a flyer, for example, have to submit it to us first 
we force them to submit it as a PDF. That way we can read it. It's not in a publisher file. It's not in a paint shop pro. It's not in a what have you. It's a PDF. We can guarantee that we can see it. We can read it. If we need to make copies of it, we can do that. Force the user to give you what you want, not the other way around. How was PD day 2020? Terrible, amazing. So far I'm having a good time. So I'm gonna check amazing. Now, notice how it's the radio button. So it works very much like that multiple choice question. So if you select one, it'll unselect the other. So you can only pick one there on that rating scale. Remember, keep your rating scales concise. A one to 10 is useless because you will end up with bad data that you cannot later distinguish. Here's that Likert multiple choice grid. Uh, rate the following statements. We have strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, and we have our statements down below. Remember they're the radio button, so they can only pick one. I'm a good student, sure. I enjoy school, yep. I have friends outside of school, no. Math is easy, I strongly disagree. This is pretty clean, and if they select anything else in that row, right, same thing here, it'll kind of deselect the choice that they've already made. Remember that multiple checkbox grid? Guess what? Check everything. I find that really difficult to interpret, so I don't use it, and that's why I skip it. It is what it is. Date of the incident, very simple. You could type it in, or you just click on the little calendar, and you get the little calendar choosy thingy. You can click today, bloop, done, quick and easy. This one, I wish they had a quicker time selector because here you have to kind of put in, you know, it's 10, uh, 16 a.m. or you can do p.m. Um, it's a little clunky. I wish it was easier, quite frankly, to, to deal with. I'm gonna click submit and I'm done. What I should get is this link that says, your response has been recorded submit another response. But we're going to go back to the form. So I go up here in the tab. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. We're going to make it fancy. So those are all of our basic question types. It's worth knowing what the different questions can can collect and what they're maybe not good for. So just, um, just think about that as, as you go along here. Let's go first up to the color palette. This comes into sort of, I don't know, intermediate maybe, not, not really intermediate, but we're going to make it pretty. Theme options, you can come in here and choose from a header option. Uh, you've probably looked at this already. Select something that's appropriate for whatever it is that you're doing, and then you can insert it. And watch what happens with the color scheme. So the color scheme changes based off of your header image. If you wanted to change it, uh, you could uh, upload your own or you could use your own photos. So here's a photo from where I, let's see if it, let's see if it picks it. That's being cranky, there you go from where I grew up, and then you can crop it, and then you can use that image, and then watch what happens to the color scheme. So the Google form kind of looks at the color of that header image, figures out some colors, um, and then if you don't like that, you can go into the theme color below, and you can um, set it, maneuver it a little bit if you wanted to. Same thing with the background color. If you want it really white or dark or whatever it is that you want, or dreary, uh, you could do that. Font style at the bottom. I know a lot of people like to uh, mess around with font styles. We talked about it in the last session, Google Spreadsheets. Uh, basic is pretty good. It's pretty easy to read. If you go to decorative, it's going to be a little bit difficult. Please realize that there are people that literally uh, cannot or have a very difficult time reading uh, script cursive style font. Um, I know it looks good for maybe a wedding invitation, but in general, this is difficult to read for a lot of people. Uh, formal is kind of good. It gives you a very sort of a Times New Roman um, Adobe Caslon Pro feel. Um, playful is probably almost never appropriate. But I have sort of a hate relationship with Comic Sans. That's just my own preference. That's my own bias. Um, 99 times out of 100, I stick with the basic fonts because they're easy to read. Um, think about your audience. So are you, um, are you sending a form out to your students? Are you sending a form out to your parents? What do you want it to look like? Things like that. 
couple of questions here. Uh, Krista agrees with the one to 10, one to four is much easier. Thanks, Krista, I love it. Uh, Jim says, what's a puzzle piece next to the palette in the dashboard? Excellent question, we'll get there next. Uh, so this is just some theme options, look and feel. The, the puzzle piece over here is a little bit more advanced. It uh, adds some add-ons to the Google form. And I would say that is advanced features uh, that we may not get into today or we won't, but I'll, I'll mention what they are. So form ranger, you would have to go and add some add-ons. Now, people uh, get disappointed because add-ons, if you are in a Google domain, are controlled by your uh, IT people. And so they may or may not allow add-ons. The way we run it here at Streetsboro is that I, I'm also the IT person, right? So um, I have shared with all of our uh, teachers that if they want an add-on that they currently can't get, just let us know. We'll review it, we'll check it to make sure that it's not sort of a, a Russian spam bot that wants to get added to Google Forms. And then of course, we're happy to, to whitelist it. But um, Form Ranger is one, um, that'll grab some data from different places from a spreadsheet and kind of connect, it connects with uh, the Google Form. Um, we have the same in Google Spreadsheets, for example, there's Formules, Autocrats, some of those things. Again, they tend to be a little bit more um, advanced uh, and that might be uh, for another class. And I would say we would do a whole class on just Form Ranger or just something else in Google Spreadsheets, but that's a good question. Let's go to the settings up here so we don't forget the gear wheel. In general settings, uh, you have the option of collecting uh, email addresses uh, and that's easy if you're working with the the, the survey within your domain. Uh, please know that you can't collect that from parents because they don't all have Google accounts. So if you're sending this to anyone outside of your domain, so any, anyone outside of school, you're gonna have to turn that off. But if you turn it on, you can then automatically send someone a response receipt, whether they want to or not. Very helpful for a lunch order, very helpful for t-shirt ordering, where they want some sort of confirmation. They fill out a PBIS, uh, referral, ship them a response receipt. Here's what you filled out and at uh, the time that you did it. Um, require sign-in. So automatically on a domain, typically we require uh, or sort of we restrict Google Forms to Streetsboro, but if you're gonna use the form with parents, just uncheck it, right? And then you can send it to anyone. The benefit here is that if you do restrict it, you can collect their email addresses and you can limit it to one response. So instead of getting 15 t-shirt orders for Susie and Calvin, you get just the one because it actually knows who you are and can kind of control it. And the message the user would get is, it says, hey, we know that you've already filled this out, so no need to fill it out again. You can always uh, let people, <coughs> excuse me, uh, edit uh, after they submit. So uh, if you have sort of some data that you want people to submit and they might be able to edit that or change their mind, you can allow them to do that. You can allow them to see a summary chart and text responses. That might be if you're doing some sort of, um, you know, feedback for uh, a large group, for example, you could do that. So we'll leave that. Um, the presentation tab only shows, it allows you to say, okay, here's a progress bar shuffle the question order or show the link to submit another response or uh, editing the confirmation confirmation message. So you can say, thanks. Now head to our website to learn more. Um, that's what pops up at the end. If you don't want it to submit another one, just uncheck it and there won't be a link to do that. But if you want it to be easy, you know, to collect more data, you can do that. At, if you, for some reason, want to shuffle the question order, like say you're doing a quiz, you could do that. Um, if you want to show a progress bar, you could do that. But I find that instead of showing the progress bar, and that's the one that shows at the bottom, like you're on page one out of 6,900, or, um, you know, or of an unknown quantity. And if you've taken surveys like that, you know that that survey bar or the progress bar really just makes you irritated. So my my advice to you is try to only have one page, one section for a Google form. If you're collecting more than that, you would want to think about your data collection uh, instrument. Uh, because if you have multiple pages, multiple things, multiple sections, and I'll show you how to do that, it just becomes a little arduous and it becomes difficult. Uh, but we'll turn it on so you can see what it looks like. And then if you want to make it a quiz, you can make it a quiz. Uh, we're going to not go to the quiz because that's, that's also sort of a whole other um, workflow. 
So that would be a separate presentation altogether, but just know that it's pretty quick and easy to um, set up a quiz. Like for example, what's the capital of Stockholm? You would just mark Stockholm as the correct one, assign a grade or, you know, sort of a point value, it would grade it automatically and it works pretty flawlessly. So those are some of the settings. Uh, let's add a section. So we come back to the bottom question. I'm gonna now add a section and you'll see what happens here. You'll get to section two that will name more questions. After section one should continue to section two. Now what you can do here is you can do a couple different things. You can do some uh, branching, for example. So you could say, um, you can add a multiple choice question here. What section is next, right? And you could say uh, section A, section B, like where do you wanna go? And then what you could do is you could say, this is section A, and I know I'm moving kind of quickly here, but I'll show you the, the idea so you have an idea of what you can do. Section B, watch this. Based on this question, right, you can go down to uh, question, sort of the, the validation stuff, and then you can say, go to section based on the answer for this question. So you can say, if they choose A, then they get to go to section A. And if they choose B, they get to section B. So you could branch it out a little bit if you wanted to. Um, my, my recommendation for you is that you, um, you think about that. And I would, I would definitely draw it out in a flow chart. If you're gonna do a, an advanced workflow, or if this is your, um, <clears throat> if you're kind of new to Google Forms, I would think about staying away from this kind of data collection, just because again, it gets very difficult in the spreadsheet. We're gonna look at the results here in a little bit. Um, it just becomes difficult to deal with. Um, and so I might be more prone to just doing two separate Google Forms altogether, if that's what you're doing. But um, I'll show you what happens here. So go to section one, we'll just say um, uh, select favorite animal. At, and then in section B, we'll say select fave food, dog. I suppose I should put something here, dog. And let's look at what it looks like. Okay, last name, Johansson. Yes, capital student. I'm gonna get my wrong answer. We're gonna select dog and lizard. What year? Any random year. I'm just adding some data, right? Four, boom, boom. So we get some more data. Today, one, 11. What selection is next? Selection A. Notice my progress bar. I have page one of three. This can get confusing because you can build it so that you go now to section A and then you submit it. So you'll never actually go to page three. That can screw people up. So just keep that in mind. Here's my section A, I select, and then depending on how the form is set up, I select and I go, and then I go. See previous responses? Here's that option for people where they can themselves see the data. You gotta be careful with this because if, um, uh, if you're sharing it publicly, just, just know, just keep in mind of what you're collecting and whether or not that should be shared publicly. So you wanna think about that. Um, all right, we're gonna come back and look at the responses here. So I'm gonna come back to my form. I now see that I have two responses. I scroll all the way up to the top. I have two responses. I get to see what they saw, right? So I have two responses. 100% um, of them are <laughs> last name Johansson. Here's my uh, responses to the long text. Here are my responses in graphical form to Capital of Sweden. Here are the pets, so it automatically builds a bar graph, et cetera, et cetera, what year were you born? Now, notice this part, this is the best part. So see how it says copy chart? If I'm presenting for someone, so say I'm doing, um, uh, doing a document, I need to pull this data and give it to my superintendent, for example, I can just say, copy that chart, come over to my Google Doc, paste it in, and then there's my chart in Google Doc or a Google Slideshow or whatever format you want. 
So think about that. That's pretty handy. I've used that a number of times, grabbed some data, thrown it into a slideshow, shared it with the board, shared it with the superintendent, et cetera, makes it super helpful. That's kind of a, a new feature, intermediate advanced feature. Just think about, again, like what the data is showing you. Um, is it going to be helpful? Uh, things like that. But again, just copy paste. Used to not be that case. You used to have to make uh, you know screenshots and they would come out different sizes and things like that. Um, but just know what it is that you're shown. Two responses. So that's not a whole lot. This data isn't even valid. Uh, you would want to be able to have that conversation with someone. Here's how the ratings chart shows up. Um, once you get some more data here, you would want to really kind of look at that. Uh, it assigns colors then strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. You have an idea for each question. If we collected some more data here, you would, you would sort of, it would build one bar for each answer for each statement. And then it would obviously go up and it would scale automatically. And so that's, that's pretty helpful. But keep in mind, um, again, what are you going to do with the data? Things like that. What I like to do, and this is helpful if you're just collecting some quick survey stuff. What I like to do is I like to come up here and create a spreadsheet. So in the responses tab, so here's my questions. Here's where we edit it. In my responses tab, I come up and I select spreadsheet and it says create a new spreadsheet. And I say, yes, uh, it'll actually then link and create a new spreadsheet and I get all the raw data into a spreadsheet that I want. Uh, Best part about that is if I'm collecting files, it gives me a file that I can access to what they uploaded. I now get the raw numbers, I get the raw data, I can actually do things with it. Um, but again, you've got to be comfortable with what this looks like and what to do. With it. Notice in column A, you have your um, um, your timestamp. The timestamp is simply when was the form submitted. And like the question before from Jim about the puzzle piece, you can then do some advanced things in a spreadsheet uh, with a workflow based on when things are submitted, um, ship things on the hour, you know, do do some things from there. But that that's for, for a different uh, course altogether. All right, I'm gonna go back to questions here. I'm gonna show you some advanced uh, features or kind of some time savers that I really like um, and some best practices. Um, I try to break up a form. So if we just go and look at this form, uh, it's kind of a one long uh, sheet and I'm going to actually, I'm going to go down and I'm going to delete these sections down here because they're not, they're not real helpful. Uh, so I'm just going to say uh, delete section, delete, delete, delete. And I'm going to take the time out and I'm going to take the date out and so on and so forth. So back up to last name. What I like to do is I like to split it up as much as I can. So best practice is you make a form that's accessible to your users so that you don't uh, run into the problem where they tire out. So if they're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, 50 questions, <clears throat> they're gonna they're gonna forget where they are and they're gonna tire out. So what I like to do is, you know, see I'm selecting the, the sections here. So I'm gonna say right here, I wanna put in a title or a description. So I'm gonna say about you. And it's just a title, it doesn't collect any data at all. And then I'm gonna say uh, here, I'm gonna say quiz questions. And then, um, right, and I'm gonna call it a day. And here's, here's the example, here's the result. I'm gonna click the preview button again. The result is now I get a, a title header here that kind of helps me break up the form. I know it looks like we added some stuff, but from a perspective of white space, uh, perspective of um, the user getting some uh, time to kind of just, you know, rest their eyes before they have to give you more information. It's helpful to put some titles in there. Um, coming back to my edit form. Uh, let's see, Becky has a question about how would I reuse the form and clear the responses? Pretty easy. Um, you can come in here to responses and then just um, delete them if you wanted to. Um, you could download them and then, or delete all the responses, and then you could just, that would empty the whole sheet or the whole form, and then you could do it again. So that's over in that responses tab, three dots, delete all responses. You could do that. Um, back to questions real quick. Um, if you uh, have some question types that you reuse a lot, 
you could do that. So I, uh, I think I mentioned I work with the bus drivers. We have a couple forms there. And so instead of me typing all of the bus drivers in all the time or even going to a spreadsheet and copy and paste, I can use a question that I already have. And here's how that works. So I go to import questions. So for example, if you have a bunch of demographic questions that you're gonna use all the time, just import them. It'll pull up all of my previous forms. And I'm gonna pull, let's see, um, T1 counting. I'm gonna use that. Is that what I'm gonna use? I'm gonna use this one. So I select the form where the question is. It all of a sudden just knows all the questions. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna bring in driver name, which is a drop down and has 30 options in it already. Import question. And now I imported my driver name. So instead of having to do last name, I can delete that one. And now I have all of my drivers there and I don't have to retype it. The result being, I come here, I select about you, who are you? Boom, select, and you have a pre-populated list. So you could do that one time for all the students that you have and then just reuse the question. And then instead of them having to type it in, they select from a pre-populated or a validated list. Notice that they don't have an option to pick whatever they want, but they can just pick up the one that you want in the correct format that you want, because that's how you're gonna use the results. Because guess what happens next, right? I put in some stuff here. Let's choose Stockholm again dog lizard, uh, right? We'll give some more survey data. I'm gonna show you in the spreadsheet, submit. Come back to the form. Now it's picking from known responses instead of having an open-ended response that you then have to mess with. And then in our spreadsheet, if I go to our spreadsheet now, the name it's not collecting that last name anymore. So now you might have to move some columns around, but look at how pretty the name comes in. So it's nice, pre-formatted. It, you're gonna be able to sort by first, you know, last name, first name, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some, some life-saving tips there, I think. Um, just a few more things. Uh, we talked about the image. So you can clearly, you can add an image and then you could, you know, you could add, um, Question about that image if you wanted to. Uh, there's one of the police cruisers, so we could use that. Uh, you could insert an, a video if you wanted to. Uh, they have to be on, on YouTube or a URL, depends on what you're doing. Let's see if we can find a video uh, from here. Yeah, fire training. Um, so um, see this video. And then below you could ask questions about it. So here's what that would look like. Image, right? Video, YouTube video, they could play it right in the form if they wanted to. Uh, and then you could ask questions about that. I use it a lot for training. I say, watch this video of how to use a tourniquet, for example, uh, answer some questions about it, and I can collect who they are, and then I get a nice record of who attend the training, what do they know, ask some quiz questions, uh, whatever have you. Um, so those are some uh, sort of beginner, intermediate, advanced features of Google Forms. Obviously, there's a lot more you can do with it. Uh, you can uh, spend a whole lot of time with the data that you get in that spreadsheet. You can do some pretty neat automated things with that. Um, there's some other features where you can allow the form to tell you every time someone submits a form. Um, just takes a little while to, to, uh, to get used to it. Think really about what it is that you want to do. So what are you going to do with the data? How are you going to collect it? How are you going to not um, sort of waste their time? How do you build a form that is the quickest possible way to collect the data that you actually are going to take action from? And that's the, the real key. You're, you're going to have to want to collect data that you're going to use. So don't collect data just because you can. Um, collect data with purpose, and then obviously try to make use of the correct question type uh, and make it as simple as you can for, for those people. So that's all I got for you. Uh, this this uh, session has been recorded, so if you want to watch it again, feel free to do that. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. 
Happy to share uh, our Google Form stuff or any other Google stuff uh, with you here from Streetsboro. Have a great rest of your day. I think the next session starts at 1050 and I'll be doing a session on uh, managing email with your priority inbox and uh, some automated filterings in your Google inbox. That'll be the same meeting link um, in about 10 minutes or so. Have a great day. Uh,